coach. Let's move on to Carl Anthony Towns. Also salty, spoke very strongly after a loss last night. The Timberwolves lost to the Sixers on a buzzer-beating tip-in from Robert Covington. Exciting for Sixers fans. Not so much for Towns. He had 23 points, 15 boards, and 5 assists, but clearly not happy. The Wolves had to fight their way back from a 26-point deficit just to get to that tip-in, and we'll take a listen. Much consolation from from the, the no, comeback, no, or, you or is there no hurt consolation? Work? There's no consolation prize. This ain't a uh, fourth grade Pee Wee football. You know, this is a uh, this is the NBA. This is a man's league. Uh, there's, a, there's a winner and there's a loser. And today we're the losers. Tracy, we saw him over the summer. He was so happy. He was in a nice <laughs> bright jacket. He looks beat up there, just in every possible way. Uh, the it's, hat, it's, the cut, it's the whatever. Not, it's not going it's a beat away. man. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it looks like it's weighing on him, but. No, the good thing about him is he's well put together. He's sharp. I like him speaking up and taking a leadership role for this team. They're lacking uh, veteran leadership. That's what this is all about with this group. I mean, they have some of the best talent, young talent in this league. You have three guys, 21, 22 years old, averaging 20 oh, plus 20 points. Outrageous. It's about leadership, preparing for yourself, staying the course, and being precise when you're out there on the basketball court. Are they going to make a deal to fill this need? I, I think they will. I would bet on them. I think they're poking around Goran Dragic as, a, as an upgraded point guard because Ricky Rubio is just is kind of plateaued and doesn't seem like he fits what Tom Thibodeau wants to do. But, yeah, I feel like Carl Anthony Towns says something like this after every game. It's, 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 really a, it's a man's league. You know, we got to win. All we, we have the pieces here. He's very, like, but he's a little snarkier than usual in this one. I like that I like that fire there. Yeah, I, I, I thought that he's, like, stepping into the adult role for yeah. his team. Okay. He's going to take that role on because he's tired of them screwing around. <laughs> right. And he's going to show them how to do it every night. And that, that's, uh, that's wonderful. I, I, that they will get other people that will follow him because uh, he, he's uh, demonstrating some leadership. And he's such a good kid. He, he is. sort of reminds me of a movie about sort of a boxer where he just gets really beat up and then he comes back. Oh, I'm just like, all right, I'm going to show everyone. I don't think this is sort of the way that the wolf season has been going I'm still a believer. I think that they are going to figure this out before the end of this season. Is that naive of me? That's very naive. <laughs> yes. Well, fix. Why? Why? I just. I don't. I'm not uh, saying they're going to make the playoffs. I just think that they. What the growing going to, we've seen them go through. I, I feel like they've got it. They've got to work this out. Right? I haven't seen any improvement. Really? Yeah, I haven't seen any improvement, and I. I just. I don't think so. I just don't think it's registering with these guys. NBA defense is really hard, and they stink at it. And they're very, they're really young players, and the way the ball moves around the floor now, side to side, like you got to stay connected, yeah. and that's the hardest thing for young guys to learn. The people in the front office are the ones that really have to get wise, right? Because they are the ones that pick the talent, and they have to understand uh, the maturity level and uh, just the talent level. If, if guy, you, they keep picking guys that can't play defense. You know, they, you need that. They're limiting themselves. Well, the guy picking the talent now is also the coach, who is also supposed to be a defensive genius. So we'll have to see where that goes. Well, let's Trade see how, and approaches. Yeah. All right, we got to take a quick break. But first, here is our distant replay from this date in 2002. I think it was at this game. This is a Wizards Jordan alert. Here comes Chicago. Oh, give me that two hands. Mm-hmm. Yep, you do it. Give me that. Come on, Ron Mercer. <laughs> Oh. None of that, please. Give me that. Just flies, catches it with both hands, pins it on the board, and brings it down. That is a remarkable. Ty Lue, young Ty Lue likes it. Happy Ty Lue. This is because at the Garden last night, there were a few audible cheers for Utah forward Gordon Hayward during the introductions. Hey, maybe the Celtics faithful really like Hayward's hair. More likely, they're aware that Hayward is set to become a free agent this summer. He, of course, used to play for Boston coach Brad Stevens when the two were at Butler, and his name has been mentioned as a possible target for Boston GM Danny Ainge. This is not the first time Celtics fans have cheered for an opposing player who they would like to become one of their own. They gave an extremely friendly reception to Kevin Durant last year. But last night, well, it set Crowder off. He played angry, scoring 21 points on 6 of 8 shooting. Later, he said, quote, I heard the cheering before the game. I didn't like that at all. I thought that was a sign of disrespect to me from the fans. And then, just in case somebody missed the message, he also took to Twitter. First came this tweet. 
Home fans cheering for the opposing players now. Aw, oh, man, shaking my head. I-, I read that in capital letters. I thought that was pretty good there. Um, when one fan wrote him back saying, hey, welcome to Boston, love it or leave it, he replied back, I have no problem leaving it. He also retweeted another fan who told him to come back to Dallas, the team that drafted him. And he also started following on Twitter the Orlando Magic, a team that's tried to trade for him in the past. Now, by this morning, Crowder had erased a couple of those tweets, but he did leave up the original one. And look, Crowder has every right to be angry over anything he wants to be angry about. There is a grand tradition in the NBA of players taking very small slights, blowing them up to red alert level levels to use them as motivation. And let's not forget that Crowder is someone who had to fight his way to being a starter in the first place, and if Hayward ever did come to Boston, it's Crowder's job he'd likely take. All that being said, once Crowder got to the Twitter stage of his evening, that's where it got to be too much for me. There is a difference between being motivated and throwing a temper tantrum, and that's exactly what it looked like. Let's not pretend the fans involved here insulted Crowder's mama. They want good players to come to their team, and if Crowder thinks he's better than anyone else the Celtics could get, His best recourse is just to keep showing that on the floor, not start attacking fans with his keyboard. So, guys, that's how I felt reading all of that stuff. Kareem, how did you feel? I I think that the players really should leave the fans alone for the most part, you know, because you you never know what you're going to get out there. You know, anybody can come and sit in the stands. Yeah, win that battle. Yeah, that's right. So you you, you should uh, should have a little bit of wisdom there and just... uh, keep your distance and uh, just say the things that uh, you can safely uh, deal with and handle uh, if they become an issue. Here's the deal, guys. Leave it to me, <laughs> right? Uh, let's just be honest. Okay. There's some, some history with crowd, um, yes. uh, Hayward and, and Stevenson, right? Yeah. Stevenson, I mean, uh, Crowder is not a better player than Hayward. So with that being said, I will cheer for him too because I will want the better player Were to you come and play for my team. Was that you? No, it wasn't. All right, just but you. but Hayward is a better player than than uh, Crowder. Um, there's history between him and the head coach, and they would cheer him on. Now you didn't have this problem when they were cheering for KD, because obviously KD is better. Hayward is is a better player too. I, I'm sorry. Don't take it to social media because you will never win that battle. With the At the same time, though, if you were him, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? You got these guys have egos. Like it would have would have gotten to me a little bit, right? Like it would have gotten to you a little bit. Well, you were too good for this whole discussion, but you know what I mean. If you were him, it would got you a little I, bit. I get that, but know when to fight your battles, though. This is not a battle. You can, you can't win this battle, especially when you're taking it to social media to go and get go at fans. Like, the fans. Yeah, you can't win that. Just just listen. If that's what motivated you to win twenty one, uh, score twenty one points. Do that on a consistent basis, then we won't be having this discussion. Also, they could play together. It's, they're, they're, it doesn't have to be like one or the other. They could play together. They're both good, versatile wings. They could be on the floor together for a lot of minutes. It doesn't have to be either or. Yes. The okay. fans are always fantasizing, though, about what, what how, how we can get a better team and right. you know how we, how we can do this. And they're always playing, uh, you know, God with the, you know, manipulation <laughs> of uh, of uh, personnel. Right. So you just got, have to understand that and and stay away from it. I just have a problem because. When KD came to town, it was they, fine. It was fine, and then Hayward comes to town. They cheer for him. You got a problem with that? that that's what I have sure. a problem. If you have a problem because you think fans are disloyal to you, don't start being disloyal to the franchise by starting following other teams on Twitter <laughs> to make a point or saying I should go back anyway. Probably not the best decision. And his coach Brad Stevenson did have a discussion with him this morning about it. So apparently he feels the same way. All right, let's talk about another team in the East. Guess who made the cover of Sports Illustrated this week? Yep, Giannis Antetokounmpo got the Lee Jenkins treatment, and there is a bunch of great quotes in the story. One that stuck out, though, was Giannis saying he could be in Milwaukee 20 years, and then also, quote, to make the next step, I've learned you need a little cockiness inside you. I can be a little cocky, he said. I've definitely become more serious. I have a franchise on my shoulders. Tracy, how far do you think Giannis can carry the bucks? Because we know, obviously, he is their franchise player right now. He's talking about 20 years. Is this a franchise-defining player? He is a franchise player, no doubt about that. This kid is next. I mean, he has unbelievable talent. He reminds me a little bit of KD and, and Westbrook a little bit with his explosiveness, you know, uh, as Westbrook, and just his length and being able to maneuver like uh, KD. Now, if he develops a jumper, <laughs> he's going to be scary. Um, but at, as great as he is at this point, being 20, 22 years old, it doesn't matter. It, what he has behind him has to improve. I mean, he could be as good as he can and, you know, being one of the top players in the league. If you don't have no dogs behind you, 
it's going to be very tough for him to, to take Milwaukee to that Shots next level. Shots fired at Jabari Parker. No, no, no. Not Jabari. It takes more than just him and Jabari Parker. There's yeah. no shots. Jabari is, is definitely up and coming. And he's been happy in Milwaukee up until then, coming from where he came from and, and all the different elements. And he talks about that a lot in the Sports Illustrated story, which is excellent. But Kareem, you were in Milwaukee, and after a while you felt like, you know what? I need to leave this place. And your situation was a little bit different. But it was a lot different. But different time and obviously <laughs> <laughs> different things going on with you. But but it is comparable only in that it is a very particular market. Yeah, it is. But, uh, you know, they're building. And uh, the fans in Wisconsin are unbelievable. I mean, I, 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 I've had experiences there with the fans. I'm, I'm still having experience experiences with Bucks fans because you keep running into them all over the place. And... <laughs> And they tell me about games they watched back in the 70s. It's exactly. incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's it, it, getting such a great reception there. And it's funny, Bucks fans have been sort of a little bit at his back. They're like, oh, the national mm-hmm. media doesn't talk about Giannis as much. We've talked about him every single day this week on the show. He's on the cover of SI now. He is getting his his now due, I think, in the NBA, yeah, right? You, you forget the media hates everything. I, every, know, I, I, will, I will say this. We spent the entire summer offseason – who is the next generational superstar in the NBA? Is it Carl Anthony Towns? Is it Anthony Davis? Is it maybe Chris Haps Porzingis? It's this guy. Yes. Right. He is going to be the best player out of all those guys. And partly because, you know, if you're a big guy, you can speak to this in the in the modern game. It's just, it's like you need someone to pass you the ball. It's harder to get into the post today than it was when you played. Like, Giannis doesn't need that. He's going to yeah. have the ball in his hands right from the start. But, uh, you know, the thing I like about him is the way he finds people mm-hmm. that are wide. They don't even know they're open. He finds them and, and gets them the ball. Uh, Lajwan's is his biggest fan. He, you know, he's Nigerian. Yeah. And uh, Lajwan's his biggest fan. He said, Kareem, you heard of uh, Antete Koko? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I got the chance to see him play, and he's he's uh, everything that uh, everything that they want up there in Wisconsin. I, I wish him well. I like that he's your personal scout. Only Kareem gets like he's <laughs> <Andrew, laughs> a personal scout. Hey, it's important to keep up on these things. <laughs> I, I do want to discuss the Dallas Mavericks, who have an issue on their hands, people. Um, they're winning. Okay, they're not the Warriors exactly, but they have won four of their last seven. They're not out of playoff contention here, and why is this a problem, you ask? Well, as the Mavericks stumbled through the first part of the season, the feeling in Dallas was that they would likely finish with a lottery pick, finally be in a position to draft a successor to Dirk Nowitzki. But they haven't had luck doing that in free agency. They've been trying for the past five years. Guys have not wanted to come there, so the draft could really be their shot. But now they're winning at least a little Zach, I mean, look, what is the best approach here for the Mavericks? Because it's hard to, you don't want to waste Dirk's final year or two. They're going to try and win. Like, more power to them. They got a veteran team. They have one of the 10 or 15 greatest players of all time. They got to, they're going to try to win. They're five games out in the loss column. They got to jump over a whole bunch of teams, probably no matter how hard they try, even though their schedule is about to get really easy after playing the toughest schedule in the league so far. They're probably not going to make the playoffs. They're still probably going to pick sixth, seventh, eighth, fifth, somewhere in there. That's just how it's going to be. What do you think that they should do, Kareem? That, that's a hard thing because, you know, the players want to win. Mm-hmm. They, they want to win every game they want, every time they step out on the court. And it's up to uh, the people in management to, to try to uh, deal themselves a, a better <clears throat> hand. So, you know, it, it, it depends on what they want to do. And that's usually decided behind closed doors. <laughs> yeah, if I'm a player, um, I, I'm not embracing, you know, trying to tank. Not right. at all. I mean, we want to win. Uh, we understand the circumstance. Uh, what happened in the beginning of the season. We wasn't healthy. We didn't have our whole team. Now we're com- we're coming to complete, and we're starting to win ball games. found out how good we can really be. So let's give it a shot. If you look at guys, you know, the top five guys that are coming out of college for this year that are projected, I don't see nobody replacing Dirk, Nowins- Dirk Nowinski uh, to, to be a franchise player. I mean, these guys are good college players, but I don't see nobody coming in you know, if we was to tank and have a number one pick and be able to get these five guys to replace the Dirk Nowitzki. I don't know. Fultz posted an Instagram picture of himself the other day, like touching the scoreboard in his gym. That was pretty cool. I know that's not the NBA game. There is now more incentive, though, for teams to tank. The new CBA, oh. because it will lock players in for even longer than it has in previous years, you're talking about teams that if you get that generational superstar, he's probably going to be with your franchise for at least a decade. For sure. I mean, the new the NBA doesn't want to talk about that, but the new CBA absolutely incentivizes people. It doesn't. It's not a huge change, but it moves the needle a little bit towards like if I can get this guy and keep him for his whole career, like I should probably try and get him. And this draft is pretty heavy on point guards, and Dallas is one of the only teams that doesn't really have a long term answer there. So you know, we'll see what happens. If some the injury thing is the wild card, right? Like right. there's no guarantee they stay healthy from now on, and that could that could tank their season. See, I knew what the two players on that side of the table were going to say. They never want to lose. Never want to lose.